Welcome back, everybody, to the GIR. We are excited this week as we move into shopping season for all of you and all of your customers and anybody else to have a great group uh, on, on the podcast this week. I'm going to turn over to my partner from the Golf Wire, Golf Wire. Uh, Kai, I, I don't speak very well or very often or very much, so just try to ignore me as we get through this. But Kyle, I'll just stop at Kyle. Kyle, take over for me. I'm a You're going to toss it over, as they say in the industry. Yes, please. Welcome yeah. back to the Golf Industry Roundtable, folks. We have three distinguished guests invited to the roundtable today. There's a cliche sort of uh, in life to let things land where they may. And when it comes to golf, business conferences, sales meeting, and networking, it looks like they may be landing on continued virtual meetings. So today we want to explore how the golf industry is approaching kind of this short-term reality of no in-person or limited in-person sales meetings and, and networking and, and switching to a virtual format and really how to maybe optimize or prepare for that experience. So. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce the panel today. We have uh, an assortment of retailers and manufacturers and, and buying groups. So we have three distinguished guests welcoming them to the round table today. I'd like to introduce Ryan Knowles from Puka Headwear. Welcome, Ryan. Yes, thanks for having us. Okay, Appreciate and we have two uh, executives from the National Golf Buyers Association. They recently completed their kind of recent virtual meeting. So we're anxious to hear all about uh, exhibitor feedback and and uh, buyer participation, et cetera. So please welcome Sarah Hutchings. Welcome, yes, Sarah. Thank you. thank you. And Lee Clapp, also from the NGBA. So I thought we'd maybe just start with you two straight away, having just completed kind of a virtual meeting. Um, a lot of directions to go. Maybe you can just give us some feedback. You obviously made those decisions months ago. What sort of transition from a, an in-person meeting to virtual kind of does an organization go through? I know we were talking offline that you'd probably rather do three in-person meetings a year than, than one uh, virtual. So take it from, from that standpoint, what's the workload like? What were the, some of the transition points that you had to wrestle with? It, our, our annual show is um, invite invitation uh, of our vendor partners who are um, uh, programs uh, they, they have programs for our group uh, as well as uh, provide financial support for the organization so it's really a great partnership um, I mean they give and get um, and the annual meeting in the show is typically in October last year was in Dallas we scheduled for Dallas this year and um, it, we typically have around 55 vendor partners there's booths and a convention hall set up um, and um, Sarah is responsible for the vast majority of this meeting, um, including menus and so on and so forth. Um, um, and we'll have typically, um, you know, all the members uh, for the most part with their buyers and uh, senior managers or general managers and so on. Uh, I think it's really about what Sarah, about 150, 60 people typically. Yes. Yeah. Um, we usually do about 350 or so room nights for you know three days or so. Off times they'll get in a couple of days uh, or a day or so early to just commune with each other and and, and uh, go over the year and best practices and um, but then you know we have a, a great best practices breakout session um, and um, and really that's where uh, Sarah you might bring them up to speed on how we run in terms of. Uh, the menus, uh, you know, how we, how, what, what a day, what each day is like for the, for the group and for the, for the member, uh, vendors. Yeah, so typically our, our show is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, the, the vendors come in, set up their booths in our convention hall while the members are doing uh, best practices, our corporation meeting, you know, round table kind of breakout sessions. Um, and then we start Tuesday with our corporation meeting and then we uh, go into the exhibit hall and the members can go around visiting all of the vendors, uh, check out the new products, kind of touch base uh, with those reps and then do a lot of their order writing for the year. So the members, the store owners, their managers, their buyers all kind of come and you know have an opportunity to walk around. Some of the vendors set uh, appointments 
most of them done is just kind of a stop by um, when the chair is open. So. I mean, just in a top overview, uh, Sarah was really uh, the architect in, in, in most of the facets, so she can speak to a lot of that particularly. But as I went through my emails, um, my memory was refreshed that we started really talking about this in earnest early June when we canceled our physical uh, annual meeting and show that was scheduled for this in October and 5th, 6th, 7th. So, uh, but we began with interviewing members who'd been on various platforms with uh, vendors or other types of virtual platforms. We, uh, Sarah conducted surveys of our group, just really trying to determine after a ton of research, uh, what would be the best platform. Um, we spent a great deal of time, and she'll tell you, on Zoom, Microsoft Teams. We have you know, both of those as platforms in our organization, uh, a company called Remo, Cvent. Um, we would have spent you know, that money for those types of operations or platforms, um, but we really needed to determine what platform offered as close as possible interactive face-to-face -face experiences, but was also the most user-friendly and familiar for members as well as our vendor partners. Um, so we decided on Zoom because after all, it seems that every household or neighborhood there's a, a Zoom expert, Sarah's ours, um, who we intercede and, and get a member or a vendor partner out of trouble or back on track trying to log on or whatever. Nothing wrong with Teams or those other ones. It's just that more survey results indicated people were familiar and comfortable with Zoom. So. Um, and, um, but a ton of, of work, not just research wise, but then the schedule, trying to set up the schedule, um, as Sarah lived, of uh, uh, three days of, of trying to mimic, mimic a, uh, in-person show, um, and try and actually drive connection, where as a, as a, in a regular show, there's a lot more casual walk-by connection and so on and so forth. So it was... It was quite a process. Um, I would say that, um, you know, the other aspect for us was having three time zones within our organization <laughs> and the reality of that. So we thought about doing a happy hour, which is really one of the more fun parts of our regular meeting, right, Sarah? Um, but we just couldn't really figure that out, you know, all the way around. Um, and just setting up the schedule itself, um, trying to have times that were, you um, uh, best for everybody, we, we typically set up a morning time and an afternoon time the following day for vendors um, um, and, you know, to try and take take those considerations uh, into play about time zones. And um, you know, we had good attendance with, I'd say, 35 or 6 of our 41 members attending. Uh, in many cases, they had general store managers. Um, and uh, what was interesting, I think, this year with Sarah will tell you, usually we've been doing the last few years a flash drive of our program book that's 269 pages. Um, so you can imagine, um, and uh, especially our, our friend from Puka putting that together, a 269-page playbook, printing it and shipping it across the country to 45 different places, the expense and time was uh, mind-boggling. And, and, and special call out to Joe, cost our program director for executing it. But what our board of directors felt was that in such a, uh, a virtual overload this year, we wanted to have something tangible for our members to have, interacting with vendors, each up, you know, uh, with their own employees and so on. So we we're happy we did it, that we printed it. Um, and that was a big change. We also sent the flash drive, but, but uh, printing that book was, was a, big, uh, a big plus. Um, and, and, and a lot of expense, but well worth it. So uh, as far as product presentations go, um, we had to go with uh, video presentations. Uh, I did some video presentations from some of the products that, that we do for our group. Uh, Ken Morton Jr. from Hagen Oaks did, uh, uh, did it for our apparel platform. Um, and that's new and fresh because people can replay that. You know, they can replay it. Uh, for their store managers or their buyers or look back at again back at it again themselves. We also recorded the, the virtual meetings, the 20 minute meetings that we hosted for our, our vendor partners. So they could our members could go back and see those. So there's a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, all in all, I would say that um, even though it went off great, we only had 
um, one or two hitches, one of which I caused, um, <laughs> Sarah will vouch for. But my wife said it best, you know, when you choose Zoom, people assume things will go wrong once in a while. So I was kind of off the hook. Um, but uh, no question, I think Sarah would agree that our, our members and our vendor partners um, can't wait to get back to a, like everybody, I guess, in our, our, our world, back to a face-to-face, person-to-person show because um, as nice as this was and, and will continue to be with uh, mem- you know, touching base with members with future Zoom meetings, which was something that they asked about uh, and we're going to do. There's no substitute for the face-to-face dynamics that, that take place. So hopefully that's a good start for you guys um, and some kind of an idea of, of what we did. And, but, you know, Sarah, what, what did I leave out? I mean, was there any specifics? I mean, I know she created about 50 Zoom links for this thing. Um, what else would you add, Sarah? Um, I think he gave a pretty good overview. Um, You know, we tested, like we said, we tested a bunch of different platforms to see what would work best for us and kind of give us, you know, that that same feeling that we have in our in-person conference. I think what's different with our conference as opposed to, let's say, the PGA show, we have the same group of people every year the members the vendors all kind of it's like a small family you know we all kind of that's our annual uh family reunion um and to have something that's a little bit more personable as opposed to you know hopping on and maybe just seeing the speaker and everybody else is muted their uh, cameras off we left everything open on zoom so when people popped in you could see the member that was popping in, you know, for our corporation meeting, you could see everybody. We showcased the speaker. Um, so it was more focused on that, but I think it really helped sort of get the members feeling like they were connected in a way that, you know, otherwise we wouldn't be able to do right now. You know, I think I may have mentioned to a couple people, it was really nice talking to somebody face to face without a mask on. You know, even though there's a screen between us, but it, it was really nice just to see somebody's full face right now. Um, and I think it just kind of gave everybody that opportunity, um, you know, in a communal way, as a, you know, as well as getting business done and taking care of everything. But I think it's important to find ways right now that we can do that. And for us, you know, Zoom is perfect for it. Um, and there was something else I had, but it, it left. I'm not quite sure. Um, but yeah, I think. You guys have mentioned attendance w- was good. 35 or 36 mm-hmm. out of 41, you said. Is that is that typical of in-person too? Or are you guys 100% when, when it's in-person? Or, or how, do, how does it compare? I think we're usually pretty close to not darn near 100%, right, Sarah? It might be a couple of things that come up a year. Um, and we actually, I think, Sarah, we, we had a couple of people who uh, had wrong time zones or, you know, whatever it might be. But yeah, it's, it's our, our regular, we put on a pretty good show. Um, if you talk to other industry people, um, not just from a standpoint of, you know, the actual uh, order writing and everything that, that's legitimate, but like Sarah articulates so well, the sense of community and family and camaraderie that, that occurs, not just through the meeting itself or in the show, but you know, at breakfast or, or at the bar or, or dinner afterward. Um, so, right. so yeah, we, but we had, I would say pretty, pretty close. I think a lot of us are probably trying to gauge Ryan, maybe you are as well trying to gauge from any shows that are going on right now, maybe what we can expect for upcoming shows as to, you know, if they're normally 20,000 people that attend, should we expect 8,000? Should we expect 16,000? You know, what, what kind of numbers sh- should we look at? So I think yours is probably maybe a little bit different animal than the uh, the PGA show, given your relationships with um, w- w- with your members in the group. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little bit more inclined to attend a virtual show with you guys than uh, replacing, replacing an in-person in-person. show like the like the PGA show. Right. Um, what about feedback? What what have you heard from your members regarding this? What ha- you know, financially, when will you guys, when do you project you'll, you'll have some idea if this is affecting 
buying in any different ways than what it has in previous years? You know, it's interesting. We, um, I would say, and Sarah was on our wrap up roundtable wrap up on Wednesday of the show, where uh, it's, it's member exclusive and basically it's a chance for members. And we do this uh, in person at our regular show too, as well, the meeting have a chance to exchange uh, what they saw that they thought was a must have, um, whether it's new products, great buys, what have you. Um, and then it's, what's, oh, it's always great to kind of dress off into sometimes into operational best practices and stuff, which is always great, particularly during COVID. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there, there's no question there's, a, there's an ask by the membership to continue um, Zoom in this case uh, with virtual get-togethers, maybe in early December, uh, maybe February after what the PGA show virtually may or may not be, and then maybe after the Masters and stuff. So, so I think that's going to be um, part of it. Um, as far as I have to say, <laughs> we do a golf bag platform um, that's our own, and I was really concerned because. Um, I mean, that's something that's a touch and feel as Ryan would, would probably agree. Um, or, you know, try the zippers, pick it up, you know, anyone who's a golfer. That wasn't there this year for us. We were worried about the numbers, but we did, like I said, some videos um, going right through a, a point by point, you know, presentation of the bags, for instance, and the travel cover. And we have twice as many booked for next year than we did this year. Um, versus last year, we only had one or two new bags. So it's amazing. And that's been pretty much across the board. Um, I, I think there's a, there is a, a point of it where and maybe Sarah would agree when they can go back and maybe rewatch a video or a presentation or rewatch uh, something and kind of get that second look at it. Um, that might be helpful. Um, maybe we just had great products. <laughs> You know, and, and, and that's probably a big part of it, designed by our committees. But right. uh, Sarah, what'd you, what'd you hear? Um, I heard a lot of positive feedback from everybody. Obviously, it's not something that can completely replace in person. And, you know, like you touched on, getting to feel, look at the products. Um, but I think it's a tool that is helpful um, that we can use going forward, um, especially just the members touching base with the vendors about products and, you know, seeing what's new and that kind of thing. But yeah, I think it was, it was overall, you know, the vendors enjoyed having the opportunity and the members as well. I sort of say that's a good perspective of, of how a show sort of transitions to, to virtual and some of the, the aspects. I want to jump over to Ryan now from Puka Headwear. If you want to just give us sort of a, a, a quick 30 second on, on who you guys are and what you do. And then I, I would just say, I know you guys are out in front of this uh, virtual selling cycle. Um, yeah. And you guys sort of anticipated what we all were afraid was coming with the, the transition of some of the bigger shows to virtual. So I'd love to hear what, from a brand standpoint, what you guys are doing behind the scenes to kind of replace the, the face to face, the tactile ability to try hats on and, and feel the different fabrics, et cetera. So. Sure, definitely. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's unique. Uh, with with Puka, we're a fully customizable hat, meaning you can change every single component of the hat. And when you don't have the opportunity to try it on or feel or look at it or, or be with a designer, it's difficult to kind of understand what it is that we can do. Uh, and we've talked about that for, you know, kind of the last two, three years, that technology is really going to be the way of, of our uh, next layout of, of how to communicate that, whether it be uh, our new hat customizer online that allows you to go in and actually create a hat using our platform. Um, or during a trade show, we actually have designers there that a customer is talking to and in real time, they're actually using our platform and designing hats. Since we can't do that in person and sometimes traveling isn't necessarily an option, we had decided, hey, we need to figure out a way to do this remotely um, not knowing that a global pandemic was, uh, you know, around the corner, but just knowing that that was going to be the way that we were going to be able to reach customers in a, a more intimate setting, so to speak, versus a trade show setting. Uh, now, hindsight, clearly, it's tremendous that we're able to offer that. And, 
you know, to replace the PGA show, we are really just going down our appointment list that we've had over the last few years and reaching out to those specific customers and setting up design sessions. You know, I was in Dallas actually yesterday, I had a design session with uh, a key customer. We worked with Pinehurst last week and it's, it's, we're really not seeing a, you know, a difference in the amount of business that we can capture or the access to our customers. So this platform has been tremendous for us. That's um, that's super encouraging to hear. Uh, on, honestly, um, yeah. I, you know, I, I think a lot of us in the in the space. I'm in a similar space. I'm selling to golf courses the same way as you are with with our company. So that challenge has been what's going to happen to our reach. You know, what's going to happen to the those you know relationships we're able to forge or what it may be. And and I'm I'm encouraged by by that. You know, quite a bit. Have you seen? Um, related to everything that's going on not just uh and, and not just shows moving over to virtual but what's happened to sales for you guys this year are you seeing a similar spike to what golf courses are uh in you know because that that surge in rounds of golf and surge in golf engagement i would assume it's it's carrying over into merchandise as well you know it is yeah we are actually statistically our our numbers of orders that we're processing and and artwork that we're, we're running through is higher than it was this time last year and last year was arguably our best year ever so yes we are seeing it you know retail was interesting retail was a little bit you know later to the game as far as the golf courses were open but the merchandise shops were not now it seems like most of them are either open or they're finding a way to get that retail touch point uh, we, we were talking to a golf course uh, and heard that they had actually retrofitted their golf cart and put a hat rack on it and gall, uh, balls and gloves. And so that creativity is certainly is, is starting to uh, come out as, as how do we retail if the shop's going to be closed or how do we just retail in a new different environment where we've got a golf course that's absolutely packed and maybe somebody needs a hat on the 12th hole and how do we reach that person? So um, but yeah, we've seen, we are very busy and we've seen the numbers come back drastically. I, I, if you asked me that question three, four months ago, we, I think still probably would have wondered where things are going, but man, it, it opened up and it has been very, very strong for us, which is great. When it comes to future shows, what's, uh, what's Puka's take? What, uh, what direction do you guys think you're going to go? We we have so many novelty fabrics. We have so many nuances to our program that we are going to want to have an in-person presence. Uh, however, this new reality and how this Zoom is is approaching is really, you know, changing the way we look at a, at a few things. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. But in the end, we will, we love that person to person, customer to customer contact and. Uh, with our product, it's it's a necessity. We really want to be in front of our customers. So um, I think Zoom, even as, as we transition potentially back to normal uh, or, or a more normal setting after COVID, we will absolutely continue to, to use Zoom. Um, but the trade show component will, will still be involved in for sure. Yeah, we had another apparel uh, line who had a scheduling conflict, couldn't join us. He's been on the show before, um, Claude, my, my friend Claude Pope from uh, Bald Head Blues. I see the surfboard behind you. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, I've seen that he's done something I thought that was very interesting was he put together a series of four videos. Uh, two or three of them are really just debu debuting the various, you know, fall winter lines and the spring lines and taking the taking the buyer, if you will, through what would have been the sales presentation, but conducting it in a video setting. So I just want to you know, shout out to him, uh, appreciate his, his willingness to, to be on and apologize for the scheduling conflict, but kind of offer that up as, as a best practice to those of you listening as to one, one way some other brands are approaching this. Um, why don't we turn the tables on you, Rob, as a technology company, you're going to be facing a bit of this yourself. What what are you guys doing as you assess the, the you know, show landscape and replace that, that sales uh, meeting aspect? Yeah, so we, we've always, let me kind of go backwards and talk about the PGA show for a moment. We've always felt like um, the PGA show benefited us. There was no question about that, but it was some portion, and I'm sure I speak for other exhibitors too, some portion of why we were in the PGA show was we felt it was 
more or less out of necessity that, that maybe it would say more about our company if we were not there than than what we could maybe accomplish by by being there so there maybe be more negativity around not being a part of the show so this year's really going to shine uh you know kind of a spotlight or put a magnifying glass or you know whatever euphemism you want to use uh on to you know actually it falls on me leading marketing for the company onto what kind of job we can do to engage the same number of customers within the same kind of marketing budget. So one thing that I'm realizing is uh, uh, these shows came with, with heavy expenses uh, related to them, not just, not just attending the show from a, an exhibitor fee or, or exhibition hall fees, as we all know, um, conferences when you're in a convention center i mean i think the last time i rented i mean literally rented a couch for in our booth because i didn't want to check one at baggage at the airport it was like seventeen hundred dollars to rent a vinyl couch for three days that was you know not so great um so it you'll easily run into middle five figures a lot of companies six figures i know taylor made was seven figures to do the pga show and i'm finding there's a lot i can do with that same marketing budget even getting some really similar face-to-face -face meetings going um so i'm working with a number of groups where you know i'm in some conversations with uh, pga magazine with um the ngf you know with a number of organizations that are dealing with decision makers in the industry to do just this whether it's organizing series of webinars that we can be face to face virtually like this in a webinar or regional meetings uh, you know one thing that we have learned about golf is it can support social distancing so there's nothing to say that you know we can't in the context of a golf club or a golf course have smaller meetings you know i can i can meet with 10 or 12 um head pros gms owners from a region or a market within that kind of context of a meeting in a in a face-to-face -face environment and spend maybe one tenth or one twelfth what i would to do the pga show so if i do that 10x 12x throughout the course of the year I wind up basically with the same kind of spend and potentially, uh, you know, potentially better meetings than what we'd have in the PGA show where I've got maybe 10 minutes with somebody standing at our booth and there's a line of people and we need to get through that and an entire team there. And um, there's, the, I think 2021 could actually expose marketing opportunities to companies that are willing to get creative and willing to take that same budget and spend it in different ways and we could wind up performing just the same, maybe better than, than what we have in what we are targeting or making goals for, for year over year growth in, in sales. So I'm excited about it. I welcome the challenge. I uh, would really like to get back on a plane again and go somewhere. I know that, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, in February, uh, it was like my seventh or eighth trip in about 60 days. And now suddenly that's the last time I was on a plane. So in February, I'm saying to myself, I am, I, you know, I'm sick of knowing like which restaurant I want to eat at at which airport based on, you know, and planning my travel schedule based on that. Um, you know, I, I was tired of it. And now it's like, man, I really love to be back on a plane again and traveling again. So um I really am excited for what the the challenge of marketing the company in a different way brings uh, from really starting now. We've got some some fall shows, one in Canada that's a virtual show that we're doing with the uh, NGCOA Canada and their Golf Business Expo. It's coming up in a few weeks. We uh, one replacement um, to our spending was we've sponsored sponsored the uh, California Golf Course Owners Association. Going to be doing some things at their annual conference and some webinars. One thing that I, as a marketer, I'm negotiating with these organizations in um, sponsorships of them right now is that kind of virtual meeting. Uh, I don't want my sponsorship to be the normal sponsorship package that they've always put together where I get a mention in their magazine, you know, my logo gets slapped on their newsletter. I don't want those things. I want webinars. I want contact. I need to be able to replace contact. So if there's any advice that I could give is one, they're willing to negotiate those things into their packages. And two, if you're marketing that for your company, pursue those things, pursue ways that you can get that kind of interaction with, uh, with your potential clients through these associations and sponsorship. And um, 
I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at how they'll open up to negotiating different packages from what their standard proposal uh, has been in the past. So, interesting. Yeah. Uh, um, why don't we open up roundtable style and just see if there's any other thoughts that the panel has in terms of best practices or ideas or or, or what have you? Because the vast majority of the people listening are in the same boat as, as all of us as we try and, and wrestle with the new dynamic of virtual meetings, optimizing them, uh, replacing the face-to-face -face experience, uh, you know, all that sort of thing. So uh, kind of throw it back open to the group. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Don't I'll, you all I'll, speak I'll at once. In, I'll, I'll, <laughs> jump in, I'll jump in quick because like Ryan was saying, um, we're going to continue to use Zoom, particularly when we're in product development stages for some of our, our platforms, because it's a lot faster and, and uh, less expensive, like uh, uh, Rob was saying, to uh, than shipping golf bags or other products around the country to our, to our committee members. But Sarah will know, she lived through this too. We had a golf bag where we, it was navy blue, it was the quite color we asked for. And um, it, it came in at uh, a midnight blue. <laughs> there, there's no making any mistake about it. And um, when you're dealing with photography or, or even videos, there's still no question that, you know, touching and feeling and um, looking at that color, is it midnight blue, is it navy, is it black, is it midnight blue? Um, I still think that one of the things when we set our meeting and show up and, and Sarah will chime in, we were careful about making sure we didn't try and roll into on Thursday the 8th. Because we were concerned about the reality of virtual fatigue. We, we were suffering it from a little bit ourselves and just the entire research and development of what we're going to do. Um, so I do think that, I don't want to say there's a, a, a kickback to a virtual, but I think that there's a, once we get past this that we're living through, vaccines, whatever you might call it, we open back up more to normal. Um, I don't like to think of this as our new normal myself. Then I think we'll be back to people embracing face-to-face get-togethers and so on and so forth. But like Rob said, I think maybe some of the organizations that have been hosting these, these conventions and meetings and shows um, are going to have to look at you know, maybe some different ways to to control uh, expenses and, and so forth, because uh, it's real for uh, for people like us and our members to travel to these shows too. So, um, kind of related to what you you, you said there, Lee uh, and, and Ryan, you might as a vendor manufacturer have a good answer to this. Has this changed your approach in selling into courses or stores with regard to are you, are you starting to send out samples that you maybe never had to send, send out before material samples, swatches, anything, you know, are you doing anything different along those lines to ensure with an order uh, when they're placing it, that they're getting what they want, that you haven't just made something, especially you're probably making a lot of branded items that you don't want a, a return on those or have to deal with, okay, what are we going to do with, you know, 60 hats that have this golf courses logo on them right now because we've got the wrong color. Yeah, you did question indeed. And we have independent reps throughout uh, the country. But uh, so a lot of times if we're having these meetings, a rep will be with uh, that customer. But we have indeed, like we were working with a customer the other wanted to work with him two weeks ago. We sent him samples in advance. So he had everything in front of him so he could make that proper decision. Because you're right, when you're looking at the difference between in our vernacular, a UV light fabric versus a tri-tech fabric on a catalog or a PDF, you have no idea what that what what the difference is. So right. yeah, things have changed a little bit that way where we're sending swatches, we're sending samples, um, things of that nature in advance, definitely. For for courses listening in that, has how has that changed the dynamic in their their placement of orders. I mean, I imagine I could go to the PGA show in the past. I could look at it. I could say, this is what I want. I can maybe even place an order at the PGA show and know okay, it's going to go into production. I can expect it at this time. Is it changing things in uh, the timeliness of an order that they need to pay attention to give themselves a little bit larger window? Is it, uh, you know, what preparation should our listeners who would be ordering from 
either you guys or companies like you, should they be planning a little bit differently now than um, wh what maybe they have in the past? Yeah, we're, we're having a lot of those conversations right now because uh, to your point, people going into the show are trying to pre-book for spring, you know, right. February, March, April deliveries. Uh, and our program has a 30-day lead time. So there, there always is a little bit of that advanced, you know, notice we need to kind of get on this if we're going to look at, at delivering in those windows. Um, so yeah, there is a, a bit of that, that component. Um, we actually, now knowing that the, the show is canceled, we're it's actually given us the ability to to speed up our time where we're actually accessing a lot of these accounts now whereas it would be you know for another two months two and a half months from now so right. we're uh, and that's the beauty of this zoom thing is is that's the access point that the show doesn't necessarily create i can reach out to a customer tomorrow and we're doing this whereas we'd have to wait to january uh, the other thing that's dynamic about the Zoom is we can bring in our account manager who, based on expenses, maybe we're not bringing them to Orlando. Uh, our owner can jump on a phone call if it's if it's a, a customer or somebody that he knows. So the the touch points on the Zoom side are, are really unique. You know, it's something that is not necessarily the same when it comes to the trade show. But um, I think I kind of went off topic a tiny bit. But yeah, things have changed oh, tiny okay. bit on the sales like, process. Yeah. Yeah. So. All very helpful. Yeah. Um, running low on questions. Any anything else from you, Rob, or or the group? If you've got questions for each other, feel free. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, I, I'm. It's interesting to hear Ryan talk about sending samples and and so on and so forth. Uh, we, I, I neglected to mention that's certainly the way we've been operating in the last uh, several months. You know, um, swatches, like he said, to determine what's midnight or midnight blue. Is, is it really the behavior we want and that type of thing? Um, so um, it's um, it'll be interesting to see. I think that point being, I think that'll continue. Um, and I'm sure Ryan will agree there's certain customer levels or areas of the country that it's maybe sometimes hard to get a rep to or, or to see um, or service. And... Um, some of these teaching moments we've experienced with this, with Zoom or like Brian said, a company that was sending out sample swatches for colors or samples in general, um, that may uh, they may help support those those retail or, or golf shops uh, um, better than they used to in the past. I mean, I, I think you know, as we're facing all these challenges, we're one thing that I think is worth mentioning within the golf industry is we're fortunate to be facing them within the golf industry. You know, we saw this this bump in activity. We've got you know an industry that's still highly engaged. I, you know, I don't want to imagine the position that we would be in, not in the golf industry, but maybe in the uh, hotel industry or the restaurant industry or anything surrounding that convention center there in Orlando that they're probably dying on the vine right now with with conferences like ours canceling while we're continuing to have some success. So I think that that's one thing worth mentioning in the golf industry roundtable is, you know, as we're getting creative and doing all this, remember that, you know, we're, we're maintaining some level of success and keep to, you know, pushing forward in there because we could be somewhere else right now. So I think we should be grateful that golf is where we landed totally yeah absolutely no question and we got to we're golf data tech when they presented to us it was interesting and we continue to, to have information flowing in that we disseminate to the group just who are these new customers golfers uh, are they re-entry will they stay how do we keep them um what happens when quote unquote, things go back to normal and, and maybe they're, instead of uh, playing golf in this area, they're going to music or food festivals or you know, they're about to go and watch their kids play soccer or baseball or playing soccer or baseball themselves. Um, yep. And um, those are all the questions. I think we just have to, as an industry, continue to try and keep these people, it's not an easy game, keep them in it um, through teaching um, and support that way and clinics and what have you. And um, and we are, uh, we forget this sometimes and, and, and you're right, Rob, we're fortunate, we're in the fun business. 
mm-hmm. you know, uh, we're in the golf business, but we're really in the fun business. So if there's nothing life or death, like I don't have to get yeah. an organ there on time or anything like that, you know, running around with a cooler, you know, it's, yeah. we're, yeah. you know, worst, worst thing that happens is I, I, damn it. I hit it out of bounds again. That, that's, that's about, that's about the worst. So and Kyle's play with me. It happens a couple times too many in a, in a round. So <laughs> when it comes to that retention component, you know, I, I really see this work from home. Yeah, it may not be five days a week as things kind of renormalize, but uh, I'm hearing a lot of uh, guys saying that, you know, now it's looking like I may go back to the office three of the five days of the week. So I think we're still going to have a good opportunity to, to capture these guys that instead of, commuting an hour each way now they've got two hours in their schedule where maybe they can still squeeze out and play nine holes and you know it's interesting because golf in general has has already kind of gotten into that how do we expedite and still get people into playing by creating you know smaller par three executive golf courses that are you know cal- high caliber golf courses and so I, I think there's going to be a nice little mirror or, or marriage of, of of how these things are timed and I think we'll be able to, to, to continue to, to keep the, the retention level on the majority of people that are out there doing it at this point. At least that's my hope. Yep. Yep. You gotta, that, that's a great point you mentioned. I made a comment there today, Ryan, to somebody that um, we don't know how many people are, are working remote or, or that became you know more golf active, uh, whether it was due to a no longer having a two and a half hour commute round trip or or just you know working remote maybe not feeling much is chained to the desk or someone over them and go out and hit balls or play golf or whatever that's a that's a great point and we hope they continue to do that don't we <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. probably a good optimistic point to uh to wrap it up yeah thanks so much everybody for joining us here today yeah appreciate the opportunity oh, it's won't uh, won't see you in Orlando in January, but yeah. I'll be there. I'll be there if you guys want to there. come on down. Maybe I'll come down and see you. We can. We'll, uh, we'll host a, a, a mini tournament or something for all those that want great. to come. Well, I'm, only, I'm only two and a half hours from you. I, I live in Boca Raton, so. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, then you have to come up, or we'll yeah. meet halfway. Yeah. We'll meet Just got to get through this weekend with the hurricane there. Whatever it is that it's coming now. So Ryan, where are you at with the surfboard on your wall? Are you closer to me? I'm in San Diego. You know, we were in Manhattan Beach for about 15 years. And then I moved to Austin, Texas, and uh, okay. unfortunately, the surf, surfboard had to go on the wall because you can't really surf out here. But... Uh, not too much. Not too much. Yeah. But you've got no state income tax. You can buy four houses for the price of one in Manhattan Beach. So there is a exactly, mass yeah. Yeah. exodus from California to Austin. I yeah, gotta tell is. you. I, mean, yeah. I must know 24 people that have made that move. Austin's really great town. Yeah. Austin yeah. might be my favorite airport in the United States too. <laughs> Stages and bars and everything set up throughout it. It's a, it's a fun little airport too. Yeah, they do a good job. They definitely yeah. do. So. Cool. I want to thank everybody for the GIR. We've got the Golf Course Buyers Association, Puka Headwear. Information will be in the show notes to be able to contact them. I'm Rob Hoffman. It's Kyle Taylor from the He's Golf Wire. Kyle Taylor. Good. We'll talk to you guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Sarah. All right, yeah.